Uh, it's good to see you here this morning. Um, just very quickly, I'm gonna, we're going to have a word of prayer here in a minute. I'm going to finish um, what I started last night because I was going over these notes. And I want to give you the good side of what I was talking on last night. This, there is a spirit of error and a spirit of truth. Um, let me go back to the original verse. We'll read that and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. There's our planets. There is, let me get, let's see, where is it? Right back. No, 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 no. No, I'll find it in a second. There we go. First John 4, 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And I am a firm and committed believer in what this Bible says. And I believe that God will never allow his true born again saints to fall into an error that will cost them their souls. And I want you to understand what I'm saying. We can be wrong about things in life in general. But there are things that are important that are salvation issues. And if you don't believe them, according to Scripture, you're calling God a liar. And God won't have that. He just will not abide that. If you have the spirit of truth in you, God's Spirit, and that, that's the good part that I want to get to this morning. God's Spirit will lead you into all truth. So let me get back over there, get to the good part, and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word. We thank you, Lord, for feeding our bodies this morning. We thank you for the good food and those that labored and worked to prepare it. Now, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this spiritual food that is our uh, more important than our daily bread. It is true that we man cannot live by bread alone. We must have and believe every word of God. So, Father, we ask God that you guide us into truth, that you bless us this morning. And, Lord, show us, Father, that even though sometimes we can be wrong, your Spirit will lead us and guide us into truth. If we search for it, Father, bless your word this morning, bless this day. And Father, we ask you, God, to bless the man that came by last night. And Lord, I can tell that he's troubled. He has a troubled soul, a troubled spirit. And I don't know any more about him other than that. And Father, he was very courteous and kind to me last night as he spoke. And I mean him no harm. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just visit with him. God, that you would help him. God, that you would heal him of whatever infirmities. You healed people in the Gospels, even of mental diseases. You healed them. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless this man and heal him and bring him to salvation. We intend no harm for him. Let us be a blessing, Father, not only to the people around the world that are watching and listening, but, Father, also to our own neighbors here in this area. Help us to be a blessing to our town and the people in this area. Father, bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Isaiah 29, 24, notice this. They also that erred in spirit. Now, this is what I was talking about last night, is that your heart is what believes either for salvation or damnation. It is in your heart. You can have a heart full of idols, a heart full of lust, a heart full of deceit. You can have that. Um, I know a young man, if I were to say his name, some of you would recognize it. But in the years that I've known this young man, he has gone through five major religious changes in his life. He started out 
Mormon went to Jehovah's Witness, switched to Bible Christianity, Bible-based Christianity, switched then to being a follower of Finnis Dake, who is a heretic, a modern-day heretic. He's now dead now. He is the father of the charismatic movement and the word faith movement. And now he is a Seventh-day Adventist Hebrew Roots believer. Five major doctrinal positions that he has changed on since he was about 16 years old, I would say. And he's in his late 20s, maybe early 30s right now. Five different ones. That mind, that kind of mind is always searching and seeking for truth and will never find it unless God finally intervenes in his life. And I hope he does because I know him and I love him. I care about him greatly. But he can never settle his mind. He gets so easily led astray, not from reading the Bible, but from listening to people. And people, I'm telling you, that's where the danger is. Man lies. Men tell lies. I lie. I am not capable of telling the 100% truth throughout my life. It's not possible that I can do that. So you will always hear me tell you, don't, don't take my word for it. Go to the word of God. And if you think about it, it makes sense that God would leave us in this world with a perfect Bible so that when we hear the lies coming out of men and women's mouths in this world, we then have a place to go to to find out whether or not they're telling us the truth or not. If you hand the cashier at where you go a 20, a 50, a hundred dollar bill to pay for your stuff, what's the first thing they're going to do with it? Take a pen and mark it. Why? Because they've designed those bills so that they're counterfeit proof. They've designed the paper. They've designed the well, whatever it is they're looking at in there. Ben Franklin's picture hidden in the paper or whatever. They're looking to see whether or not it's counterfeit or it's real. Because if they take a counterfeit bill, they just lost a hundred bucks. And somebody just stole a hundred bucks worth of stuff out of that place. So aren't you glad that you know and believe in your heart that you have a place, a resting place that you can go to to find out the truth? And that's what he's saying here in Isaiah 29. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding. And they that murmured shall learn doctrine. Those and murmuring, what is murmuring? Think about it. You get a room full of people and they're all talking all at once. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Murmur is one of those words that sounds like what it's trying to describe to you, like babbling. Babbling is babbling. And murmuring is everybody talking all at once, and you cannot discern what everybody's saying. You cannot hear the distinctive voices. All you hear is a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. And that's how some people are doctrinally. They cannot understand Religion. They cannot understand Christianity, so to them it's mumbling, it's murmuring, it's babbling. But finally God brings them to a place. Who in here, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, came out of some cult system or some other system of belief to believing Jesus Christ and the Word of God? Who, who would raise their hand? People here, and pe I know people online have. They've come out of a false system where they erred in spirit and they murmured false doctrine, but now God has brought them to a place where they understand the Bible and they learn doctrine. Somebody say amen. Matthew 22. Oh, this is important. Turn there and underline this verse. This is important. Matthew 22. 
Verse 29. And, and see, they asked, they asked, they were asking this question about the law. And they were trying to, they were trying to trap Jesus with the law. Are you kidding me? Jesus wrote the law. You're not going to trap him. They were trying to trap him. If a man had a wife and he died and left no, left no son, then the man's brother takes the woman to be his wife to raise up seed to the brother. He dies. And this poor woman's got to go through seven brothers. And they're all wanting to raise up a child. And finally, they all die. And nobody is an heir. They produce no child. So they ask this silly question, in heaven, whose wife is she going to be? And Jesus immediately said, you do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Where do our doctrinal errors come from? They come from not knowing what the Bible says. So when God put me on this little journey, 19... Uh, 1997, November of 1997, God put me on this road of studying this Bible. And he used something that I've always been interested in anyway, which is Bible prophecy. So God used that love of prophecy to get me to finally read and study my Bible. And I've, I've said this before, but I made the promise, God, I'm throwing everything out and I'm just going to, I'm going to believe it the way you say it. And I found out so many things that I didn't know before that now I know. I know them. I don't just believe them. I know them. And you can know them too, but you'll know them from the Word of God. I'm just here to help you attach you to the Scriptures. That's all I'm here for. If I can do that with humor, if I can do that with the things that I say, if I can do that by showing you neat things like DNA and all that stuff, if, if I can use those things that God has given me to draw you to the Word of God, then so be it. But I'm not the guy you follow. You follow Jesus Christ. You follow His Word. First Timothy chapter 6. Having food and raiment. Let us be therewith content, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. That's why there are no millionaires sitting here this morning. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of... Is, and this is what separates the King James from every other modern translation. All the other modern translations say the love of money is a root of all evil. The King James says it is the, which means it is the singular root of all evil. And if you don't believe that, go to Revelation 17 and 18 and study Babylon. Babylon is destroyed and the merchants of the earth cry over her and bewail her because they were being made rich by her. Babylon is any religious system, and I'm going to say it, like the Catholic Church that sells forgiveness from God like Walmart sells gallons of milk. That's wicked. That's evil. That is Babylonian system at its best. To sell forgiveness of God. And I, I'm just... I, the more I read about the Catholic Church from their own books, from their own literature... Like one day I was reading, I got, had this Catholic Bible and had these articles in it, and it was explaining like rosaries and the crucifixes and things like that. And it said, if, if you are somebody that has a crucifix that was blessed by a pope, you have forgiveness of every sin you ever commit. And when you die, you will instantly go to heaven. If you have, if you're wearing a crucifix 
that was blessed by a pope, you have forgiveness for the rest of your life for, for every sin that you commit. Now, let me ask the question. Do you think the pope just gives those away for free? Not a chance. Crucifixes like that go to billionaires, mafioso, mafia guys, corrupt politicians get crucifixes like that in exchange for either political favors or monetary favors. That's how that stuff is gotten. And the Catholic Church is full of garbage like that. The love of money is the root of all evil. And what happens is, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. What do you think happened to Jerry Falwell? Back in the 80s, um, when I was a teenager, I used to love Jerry Falwell coming on. I'd listen to his preaching. But then he started changing. He's number one, he quit preaching out of the King James. And then I remembered on nine after 9-11, Jerry Falwell comes out and says, This is God's judgment upon our nation for homosexuality and for all the adultery and abortion and all this stuff. And then there's an uproar, and four days later, he gets on the news and apologizes for saying that. I'm sorry, but if you're the man of God, and you're right from the Word of God, you don't apologize for it. You say it. That's the job. But probably what happened, and I know this for a fact, that Jerry Falwell, the money that was coming into his church and his organization, his political organization, and his university was coming in from places all over the world, and you can't operate the things that his ministry was operating without literally millions of dollars coming in every year. And more than likely what happened is some phone calls were made and some people said, we're going to pull our funds, our millions of dollars that we send every year, unless you apologize for what you said. And then he gets on later and apologizes for what he said. And his son, Jerry Falwell Jr., is an absolute total disgrace to the ministry. He's been caught now in multiple affairs. It's sickening. And what started it all? The love of money. It's the root of all evil. And it causes you, if you covet it, you will err from the faith. See, Jesus was right. You cannot serve God and mammon, which is money, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Second Peter chapter 3. Verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Aren't you glad God was patient with you? How many years did it take for you to finally get saved? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And God long-suffered with you. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Yes, there are some things in the Bible that are hard to be understood. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. W-R-E-S-T. Do you know what that word means? It's where we get the word wrestling from. And what it means is when two guys are wrestling, it looks like their bodies are twisted together. When you rest scriptures, you take it and turn them around to make them say what they don't say. And that's how it's done. I, I have listened to dozens of false prophets, false teachers on the internet, on television. And I know their method of operation. They, they're going to bring you to a point at which you're going to no longer believe in the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. Jim Staley was as good at it as anybody as I ever heard. He's out of prison now, but he was one of these Hebrew roots teachers. And he had a study on Romans and Galatians, because Romans and Galatians will tell you that we are not saved by keeping the law. But once you listen to Jim Staley or anybody else's like that, you listen to their teaching of Romans and Galatians. By the time you're done and you have listened to what he said, 
you will believe that the book of Galatians actually tells you that you cannot be saved unless you keep the law. And Galatians never said that. It spoke out against it. Some people will tell you that you must be saved by faith and works. By grace and works. And yet, here's Paul saying, if it's of grace, it is no longer of works. And if it's of works, it is no longer of grace. He said that clearly, but these false prophets will take that and they will rest that. They will twist it and have you believing that you must be saved by works and by grace. And God said, no, there's no way the two of them are impossible to exist in the same place at the same time. So he said in verse 17, well, let me finish uh, verse 16. They that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. He never mentioned preaching and preachers. He mentioned scripture as what you're to learn from. So he says, ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. You see, if I convinced you that the King James was the right Bible, beware, because somebody else then can come in behind me and convince you that it's not. But if God writes it in your heart, it's there to stay and it's not going anywhere. That's the spirit of truth that I've been talking about. John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What does that mean? Come up here and try to take this away from me. Okay, you're not going to do it. I'm not going to go to some other religion. I'm not going to go and turn Hebrew roots. I'm not going to become a Roman Catholic priest. I'm not going to do these things. I'm going to keep these commandments. I'm going to keep this Bible as my only. The early Protestants came up with a phrase, sola scriptura. What does that mean? Scripture only. And they spoke that in the face of the papacy. Because the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, clearly says that it's not just the Bible. It is the Bible and the tradition of the Catholic Church that tells you how to be saved. Which is why then they tell you, you must go to the confessional. You must pray the rosary. You must pray and bow to statues of Mary, Jesus, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. That you must do these things in order for salvation. And God clearly says no. So it's only the scripture. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. That he may abide with you for how long? Forever. Even the spirit of truth. There it is. See, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And what did Jesus say was the truth? Thy word is truth. John 17. So when you open this Bible, and let's say that you, you didn't, you're just coming to this sort of new, and reading the Bible is new for you. The Holy Spirit will be right there with you as you're reading. And he'll give you a little bit of understanding today. Hear a little. And then tomorrow you read it, and he'll give you a little bit more understanding tomorrow. And as you keep reading, the Holy Ghost then all of a sudden is going to start putting things together for you that you just, it'll blow your mind. It, you will cry reading your Bible. You'll cry. You'll get the doodads from reading your Bible. Because the Holy Ghost starts putting things together for you because he always is present when this Bible is being read and believed. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him. But ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Um, turn to Ephesians 1. 
This uh, is a companion to what Paul said about the Holy Spirit being the evidence of our salvation. He says here in John, I have it up on the screen, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. In Ephesians 1, if you look in verse uh, 13, in whom ye also trusted, meaning you trusted Christ, after that you heard the word of truth, the word of truth, the Bible. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And then he said, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Now one of these days, one of these days, the false prophet is going to cause everybody on the earth to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Now, I right now do not know what that is and what it's going to be. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how it's going to be administered. I just know that everybody in the world is going to want it because he's not going to force anybody to take it. So think about it. There are companies now who are trying to force people to take the COVID vaccine against their will. Could that be the mark of the beast? Not a chance. Not a chance. It's not. It, and in fact, it doesn't even match scripture. Because it's forced on people that don't want it. But in this case, the mark is wanted. He causes them to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And once they're marked, they're sealed to, de to destruction. According to scripture, God then will take everyone who has received that mark and cast them into the lake of fire. And there are zero exceptions. And Tim LaHaye, who wrote the Left Behind series, Remember that books? It was a book, a set of novels about the rapture and what's going to happen after the rapture. And him and uh, Jerry was it Larry Jenkins, the co-author. They put in the book called The Mark that a man, one of the characters, received the mark of the beast. But then later he said, "I don't want this. I don't want to die and go to hell." And he's told then in the book. It's okay. God doesn't look on the outside. He looks on the inside. He's telling people that if they take the mark, they can still be saved after that. And God said, no. You see what they're doing? They're resting and twisting scripture. Um, John MacArthur was asked this question. He was asked... In a Q&A, which, by the way, I think we'll do that this afternoon, have a Q&A. But he was asking in a Q&A, are there people who take the mark of the beast going to be in the thousand-year reign of Christ afterward? And MacArthur said that he believed that people who received the mark would actually get to live in the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. And I went, how, do you, how in the world do you say that? How do you come up with that when the Bible clearly says that everyone who takes that mark is going to be cast into the lake of fire and there are no exceptions? So anyway, where was I going with it? Ephesians, when you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, you know in you that you are born again and that God is going to keep his promise with you. We are convinced, I am convinced, Paul said, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And when you have that belief in your heart, you know you have the spirit of truth in you. And he said, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. John chapter 15, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you. John 14, John 15, and John 16 are beautiful chapters in learning about the Holy Ghost 
and what the Holy Spirit will do for those who receive him. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Remember those four nerves that come directly out of your brain and go down into your body. Remember what we taught last night? Those four nerves that come right out of your brain. That is God, a picture of God sending his word down to you in this world. The book that we believe did not come from this world. It came directly from heaven. Somebody say amen. Which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. And then in John 16, turn there. And I think I'm almost, yeah, I'm done. John 16, I'm not done for the day. You can't leave yet. John 16, I love John 14, 15, and 16. Study those. Write that down. When you get home after this meeting, you take your Bible and study those three chapters. You're going to learn about the Holy Spirit. And he's all, Jesus calls him the comforter. The comforter, the comforter, the comforter. What do they call couches? A comforter. Why? Because when you lay down on them, you go, ah, that feels good. That's what the Holy Ghost will do. John 16, 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So stop and think about this statement for a minute. Jesus had more doctrine to teach them, but he said, you cannot bear them now. So what happened? He left, went to heaven, sent the Holy Ghost down to the apostles, and they wrote those things down. Paul did, James did, Peter did, John did. They wrote those things down that Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. He said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, which is the day of Pentecost, he will guide you into what? All truth. People, I promise you, I'm telling you guys here and I'm especially telling you guys on the internet. Because the internet is pumping out false doctrine 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And because it's on Facebook and because somebody you know sp spread it on Facebook and you looked at it, there is a potential for you to be in error and believe something that's not true. And what it's doing, it is scaring people out of their minds because they're hearing things like right now that this COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast. And oh my goodness, what am I going to do? It is freaking people out of their minds. And all they need to do is read their Bible. And they'll learn the promises of God and they will believe the promises of God that God will not, God will not allow us to be led astray. Did he not say, my sheep know my voice? We used to, Lisa and I, when the girls were real little, we were pastoring out in Richwoods, and one of the deacons was a cattle farmer, and we went to dinner over at his house one Sunday afternoon, and he took the girls out, and he said, girls, watch this. And he went, suck, 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 like that. Here come about 40 cows walking across the pasture right over to the fence. And what happened? They knew his voice. And that they knew that that meant there was feed in the little bin that he put out there. And it was time to eat. And I tried it. And they wouldn't come. Because they didn't know my voice. I'm telling you that if you're truly saved, truly born again, you have the Spirit of God in you, you'll know God's voice. You'll know it when you hear it. If you're His sheep, that's a promise He made. So verse 13 again, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you what? He'll show you prophet. He'll show you the future. 
He will show you the future. He'll show you what's going to happen, how things are going to turn out. All things that the Father hath are mine, and therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall shew it unto you. He will show you these things. But what do you got to do? You got to, number one, read it. And number two, believe it. And if you'll do those two things, God will bless you. Let, let me um, go to Matthew 24, and then we'll take a break. And then I'll switch over. We're going to get weird here in about 10 minutes, all right? I'm going to give I'm going to show you the supernatural Bible. We're going to talk about giants, fiery flying serpents, demon possession, devil possession. We're going to talk about all that stuff. Cuz that stuff didn't just happen 2000, 3000, 4000 years ago and it's gone away. It's still happening today. Do you believe that? And your Bible is telling you that it's happening. Uh, Matthew 24. Um, let's look at verse 10. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Uh, it sounds like we're almost there right now. The false prophets are everywhere. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that it shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And he's talking about enduring in faith. Um, I don't know what I'm looking for. But I'm looking for, yeah, okay, look at verse 23. No, let's go back to 22. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. And trust, trust this book. When they start saying that, you won't believe it. You won't believe it. The spirit of truth in you will be telling you, don't believe that. Don't fall for that. Then it says, verse 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders. And here it is. Here's what I was looking for. Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The very elect, very means truly. The truly elect. Those who are really saved versus those who play saved. Are there people in churches who play like they're saved? Yes. And there are millions of them all over the place. There are preachers who play like they're preachers and like they're saved, but they're not. And I'm telling you, no, no, no. The word of God, Jesus himself is telling you in this verse that when these things come, he will not allow you to be deceived by them. He promised you that he won't let that harm you in any way. And this Bible is full of promises like that to give you the assurance that Jesus himself will never let anything harm you so that your salvation is not possible. Is that you understand what I'm saying? He's not going to allow you to go to hell. He's not going to allow you, Gary, praise God, amen. He's not going to allow you to take the mark. He won't allow you. You don't have to worry about finding out what the mark is. I got to read the internet because there's stuff going on and I got to find out what the mark is. Don't worry about it. Doesn't God know what the, ark, the mark is? And did he not promise his will that he would not allow us 
to be seed to take that mark. Did he not just say that? So trust him. Trust him. Father, bless your word. I don't know that I can say it any I know I can't say it any better than you can. And Father, give these people faith. Give me faith and trust that I just rely and fall upon this book and believe it. And not worry about what's going on in the world. Not worry about what's going to happen with the banks and with all of our money and our food and, and, and taking the mark. and all. Father, help us to just not worry about this stuff. But to trust in your promises. You fed Israel every day. And we have no reason to believe whatsoever, God, that we're any different than Israel. You promised you would never leave us nor forsake us. Father, help us to hold on to these promises, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen.